This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Welcome to the show. Hope you're well. I've got a conversation with the great Andy Scott from Sweet or The Sweet. Either way, you know who I'm talking about. The reason for the conversation, the catalyst, is an Australian tour which is happening throughout November 2024. I will put links to tickets and also the dates in the episode description. Now, in this chat here, it was one of those ones that I've been looking forward to the possibility of having for some time because Andy's an original. Let's not forget that Andy was there at the very beginning when so-called glam was taking off and his riffs, they've been copied and borrowed. It was certainly interesting to hear his take on his interactions with a burgeoning Iron Maiden. Stick around for that. Some stuff there that I don't think is actually out in the general public actually. So that's a bit more than just interesting if you're a fan of Iron Maiden. Elsewhere, of course, it was just fantastic to talk to a legend discussing his uh, the perception of his impact on heavy metal and extreme metal, their look, in addition to the riffs. There's certainly plenty of uh, indicators out there that's sweet have had more than just a passing influence. So let's get to it. Here he is, the great Andy Scott. I was going to say, what what a fantastic name, um, Mackay Smith. Yeah, yeah, and uh, definitely uh, origins in your part. Is your origin Irish or Scottish originally, or are you English? Welsh. I'm Welsh. Welsh, okay, there you go. Even though my name is Scott, you know, uh, in the background somewhere, there must be some Irish-Scottish connection somewhere, so... Yeah, yeah well, I think but, it is. But, jo- yeah. but, but joining two names like Mackay and Smith, it, it, it reminds me of the Monty Python era. <laughs> That's yeah, true. Actually, I didn't thought of it in that light. Yeah, yeah. The, the origins are a bit murky. There's not many of us. I think the family moved from Scotland in the. Well, my father's family obviously have been uh, carrying my father's side, but moved from Scotland to the US in the early 1900s, and then. Eventually, well, in Australia, that's that's the the broader story behind it all. And never been to England, Ireland, Scotland, or Wales yet, but no doubt I will. Yeah, where are you based? Gold Coast, so south oh, of Britain. So, so we're talking Tweed Heads, Twin Towns, the gig then. A hundred percent nailed it. Yes, you get it. Mm. Yeah, you get yeah, it. Yeah, we played there before. Yeah, how did you find it? Lovely. I mean, I, I love Australia. Um, uh, I've had. Um, I've had some interesting moments out there, you know, um, very first time we went over there, uh, I did a little bit of, um, you know, scuba out to, uh, on the barrier reef, you know, stuff like that. Uh, we've even never been to, uh, was it Uhuru? Uh, Uhuru? Ayers Rock, yeah, Ayers Rock, Uluru. Uluru. Yeah. Uluru. Spot on in yeah, the middle um, there. Yep. I said Uhuru, that's, that's Star Trek, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uluru, never been there, but flown over it once. Okay. Um, uh, We played in a place called Mount Isa. Yep. Which is a big hole in the ground. Yep. um, And and about a thousand uh, miners, you know, which which, which was interesting. And um, uh, uh, as I say, you know, the the territory itself. I've even been out with a a ranger in Tasmania. one of the guys who looks after the uh, the lakes and the fisheries because I'm a I'm a fly fisherman, oh. and I went out went out with him one day and he was in the back of his truck he had a like a chilled um, trout about six inches, mm. lots of them, and he'd stop and say, "Oh, uh, that's a new lake that I haven't seen before," and he he tip a few of these 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 trout in there and we and then we went fishing. And you know, I, I met a a tame uh, wombat that was living in a uh, like a restaurant truck stop thing, you know, and um, it yeah. was great. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. Well, you, but you, it does hint at the the broader uh, point, I suppose, which is that you have had a very long and successful career in Australia, yeah. just about chart positions and the way the band was embraced. Were we outside of the UK? Were we one of the first territories to embrace the world the, the suite? Um, I think mainland Europe uh, and places like Australia, um, absolutely. Um, uh, we, were, we were very lucky to have um, uh, 
And of course, you're, you you speak the Queen's English better than the Americans do, <laughs> so it's um, it's it, it's an obvious place to come. I mean, I think the first place we went to outside of Europe was New Zealand uh, in 1972, mm-hmm. and then we came to Australia. Um, uh, and well, we we've never looked back. I mean, part of the problem for us with Australia, where Susie. Uh, Susie Quattro has mm. has been there every couple of years. Yeah, you're right. And um, and she's a huge star out there. She stuck at it at a at a time when, if we were not finding a promoter who would take us to Australia, we would kind of go, oh well, maybe something will show up in a couple of years' time or whatever. Mm. And of course, we had long gaps from uh, through the nineties um, and the and the early two thousands. Mm. And then we started to do these rock the boat cruises out of Sydney. Yeah. And it's kind of rejuvenated something. So, hence, you know, uh, we've come to a point where I'm 75 this year. So, um, I think the promoter has kind of said, "Well, we better call it the farewell tour because, you know." Um, uh, and, and I thought, I thought he's got my sense of humour, that geezer. <laughs> you know, I like it. You know. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. It is being. I mean, you, you got to build these tours as something. Okay, they can't just be. Yeah. They've either got to be album focused or end of the road, like the Kiss thing, or this is it yes. in terms of what they're doing. But it, it, talking to you now, you, you feel it, it sounds like as though you're full of energy, and it sounds as though you can you can keep on doing this. So, is it really the last tour? Do you think? Um, we said something um, on this side of the pond um, that we don't want to do those tours that take you away for six to eight weeks, and every other night you're performing, and because. In the end, that's what that's what will do me in because um, mm. you know my um, my well being is is as important as anything. Yeah. But when 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 the guy said uh, when we were approached to say, well, look, you're doing the rock the boat. Why don't you do some dates? Those some dates started off at six or eight. We're now talking about twelve or thirteen, um, and and we're getting to the point now whereby we will be away for for a month. Now, I don't mind that. As long as at the end of it, we all come out of it feeling healthy and good, and and we, we've achieved something, and I think we will ach- we will have done that on this tour. I'm not saying it's the last time we'll come to Australia because I really hope it isn't, but um, we might have opened the door to do a couple of less dates in slightly bigger places, if you know what I mean. So, who knows? Yeah, I couldn't. I was thinking that because we recently had something called the Pandemonium Festival, and there was all sorts of issues around it. I don't know the details around it, but anyway, half of the bands, more than half, I think, actually ended up cancelling. And you had right. eventually you had Psychedelic Furs, Alice Cooper, and Blondie headlining it. But that was there was a ton of other bands like Placebo and and the like pulled out because just the. the I understand exactly what you're saying. You're at a point where those long tours are bullshit and they're ridiculous for a start for someone. Forget about your age. I'm 46 and I wouldn't do it. It's nuts, okay? Yeah. But the festivals tend to pay a bit more and it's a bit more of a gravy train, so to speak. It's a bit easier. Has anybody hit you up about doing them? Um, If you're further down the bill, even in Europe, the money goes to the – headliners on each stage yeah okay so even if even if you're second or third like like, we're playing a a festival called wacken this year the big heavy rock festival in germany now we are on the opening day um the first major act to play in the like four o'clock in the afternoon Hmm. on the on the opening stage uh which is one of the main stages and um i know for a fact that uh, if we were playing second on the bill instead of like in the third tier, uh, the difference between the, the costings and everything would be fantastic. But we want to do this festival, and they know that. So, you know, um, we we it's, it's as if we're going on tour. We get all the crew, all of the equipment sorted. And we are going to do the best show that we can. And that's the way it will be. Now, traveling halfway around the world, you've got to make sure that that guy has what you want equipment wise to do the tour. And I know that by playing in Melbourne one night, 
and then going up to Airlie Beach and then traveling down to Ad Adelaide, we are not going to be using the same equipment mm -hmm. on every show. It just yeah. can't happen that way unless we're flying everything. And then that just chucks the budget out. So um, it, it's a bit of a compromise, but uh, I have some guys in my, um, uh, in my crew who are on the, on the ball with all of that. And um, they take the pressure away. As long as I only have to say everything all right, and if they if they look at me in the right way, I know everything's going to be fine. But mm. if they don't, um, I then said, whatever it is, you'll sort it. And he goes, I will. You know, okay. so it's um, uh, it's a um, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I have to say, um, there's every other every other day is is a day off. I think uh, we've got a run of three. I think around um, Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest of it is, um, you know, there's a little bit of space here and there for travel and, you know. Yeah, doing the fly fishing people, people, stuff you want to do. Yeah. Well, people keep saying to me, so what, what are you going to do on your night off? And I said, sleep. Yeah. You know, Don't blame that's me. what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> you, ra you raise Wacken, and it's a very good point. And here's a question for you around that. Sweet were the first band that I'm certainly aware of to adopt a look and even a sound to a point that you would vaguely call heavy metal. Now, you might have been asked this question before, but I haven't come across it, and I listened to a few of your interviews, but are you aware of just how many extreme metal bands you may have influenced? Um, I certainly know how many in that hair, of the hair bands of the late 70s, early 80s in America. Hmm. Um, Nikki Six from... Motley Crue used to ring me up in the uh, well, 1980, something like that, uh, about mm. three or four in the morning. And I said, do you know what bloody time it is over here? And he said, well, we're just about to go out. And and and, and somebody had given him my number, which I didn't mind. <laughs> um, and I said, well, if you're a band, send, send me some material. I mean, now you could have sent it over, <laughs> over the internet. But back yeah. then, I said, a cassette arrived and it was, well, for want of a better word, it was horrible. It, it, it had no definition, you know, and you could hear that the songs were uh, quite de derivative and, and you could see they needed a producer, some, somebody to just uh, put it, pull it together. And I said, send me a ticket and I'll come over to LA. I said, I haven't, I haven't been in a couple of years. so, And the ticket didn't arrive. And a few months later, they'd been in the studio with Roy Thomas Baker, the Queen producer, and he had obviously not that bunch of recordings into some um more listenable mm. uh, thing and then they were away and um um it's even even today you know we're, we're still being dragged dragged in when motley crew are on tour and this they're, they're kind of saying well if you'd have seen sweet in the heyday you know and you, yeah. you enjoyed it then go and see this band you know that that kind of thing so you know it's um i i I, I don't take umbrage at anything anymore because anybody who's enjoyed what I've done in my life, you know, I take that as a positive. Mm. I was just I was just watching the video to Teenage Rampage, the Savo, that's all, and I was looking at looking at particularly what, what you were wearing with the leather mm. the leather outfit I'm talking about. Now I don't think anybody I mean I'm sure KK Downey has probably spoken to you about this or whatever, but they must have taken some cues from the way you were dressed up back then, and even that higher vocal, you know what I'm talking yeah. about? I'm, I'm a muso, so I sing yeah. it as well. Nobody did that be, no, it's prominently. Here's the key word, prominently before you guys. So it's great to hear that Nikki Six did that, but Molly Crew, they're not that influential musically, are they? They're just a bit of a cultural zeitgeist because of how disgusting they've been. But Judas Priest... <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but Priest and Maiden are respected, as you know. And and yeah. surely to goodness they've taken some cues from me. So have they given you that feedback? Well, I had um, the w worst thing for me is I was in the middle of producing another band, and their manager, um, the Iron Maiden's manager, knew my agent. Um, they went to college together, and he said, "There's this new band that EMI are signing called Iron Maiden. Can you get fit them in? To they, they've got a song called Running Free, and the drums are all over the place." Hmm. So I said, "Let me have a listen to it." They came in and I cancelled the weekend with this band and said, I'm now all my equipment was set up there and a drum kit. So they came in and uh, Dave used my guitar rig and he was like saying, this sounds phenomenal. 
you know, and we, we, we did a brand new backing track, but the singer, Paul Diano, couldn't sing. He'd done something to his stomach. Yeah. Now, I wonder whether they were coming into the studio to, recall, re, to to just try and replace the drums. And I said, well, if you can get a drummer to play as out of time as that drummer, you know, <laughs> with some slightly yeah. better sound, mm. I said, I doubt very much if he's going to be able to do it, and we can't straighten the... Because you have followed the, the old drum, yeah. which sped up and slowed down. So we had to record a new track, and it really sounded good. We also s recorded a track called Transylvania, which I think appeared, an instrumental, which appeared on one of their EPs or something. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then I never heard any more. And then I think they realized, EMI, that if we don't do something about it now, the moment's gone, and they appeared on top of the pops with the demo, uh, which wasn't great, but it got them r off and running again. Yeah. And then, then the next thing I hear, they've replaced the singer. And, and I then realized that I was probably being used as as a way of getting them started and then getting um, a, a better singer in, if you know what I mean. And I yeah. don't even think the singer knew that they were in the studio with me. You know, it's it's that kind of, you know, you know what you know what the music business is like. You, um, yeah. a, a bit of smoke and mirrors happen here and there, you know. Yeah, I'm hearing you, yeah. But is it? Is it flattering to know that you've played that role? You know, it, it's hidden. I, I get that, but you've certainly played a mentoring role and certainly an, an inspirational role. Do you? Do you? I mean, I understand you don't walk around thinking about these sort of things, but in these moments during interviews, when you get asked the question, does that give you time to reflect and go, "Well, hang on a sec. I was at the beginning of a lot of this stuff." Um, respect is uh, is a big word for me, and and every time I meet other musicians. Um, I get the feeling that there was immense respect for for Sweet and the and and what and what we did. So for me, that that's the take. You know, you mm. you you take what you can, and and I have to say that um, uh, as long as the band was was respected, I mean, I bumped into Kiss quite a few times, and um, um, <laughs> I've got a mm. fantastic. Maybe I shouldn't say this because it's going to be used on my birthday at the end of the month. I've got uh -huh. a fantastic video of um, uh, Gene Simmons about to go on stage in Chile, Santiago, at the, from the beginning of this year, um, uh, Santiago in Chile. Uh, and he basically, uh, he's been asked to do a video and he looks at, looks at the camera and goes, hey, Andy, you know, he said, I've been asked to do this video. And he said, we're just about to go on stage. And then he, he turns and goes, where are we? And the guy goes, Santiago, Chile. He went, yeah, Santiago, Chile. And then he said, I have to say, Ballroom Blitz, because it was something like the 50th anniversary of Ballroom Blitz. And he said, oh, you know, we still play it all the time. He said, um, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's a great, great piece of video. And here we are, you know, 50-odd um, years later, and you've still got the respect of a guy like Gene, you know, who he doesn't mm. need to do this kind of thing, but he wants to, you know, it's great. Yeah. yeah. I think my first awareness, I'm 46, as I've mentioned, so Wayne's World was huge, as, as you're probably uh, aware. Yeah. It probably comes up every other interview, but do, do you feel like that, that as much success as a prominence it might have given you to a certain generation, did it feel like as though you typecast the band in a certain light? Well, I think the UK has a little bit of a, um, it's not lazy journalism, but they they pull up Wikipedia, they pull up, and the majority of it is about what happened in the UK in the seventies and dressing up and hmm. you know being um, being banned from playing certain circuits of ballrooms and you know getting arrested and and all that. Well, hmm. yeah, that that's one side of the thing, but we're still here fifty odd years later, and we're still doing you know uh, half decent stuff. It may not have that uh, instant glitz um thing that the, that the glam rock era um had but mm. but it's still it's it's still kind of valid and um uh but but around the rest of the world uh, germany i mean they, they've gone with us they've followed us all the way through and mm. and because of that you've got scandinavia and uh austria um switzerland and uh, some of the eastern bloc like poland and czech republic who who are still in the um um in the zone with it, with it all. I think, I think Australia are, are partly there because we do get a lot of uh, input from people in Australia on the Facebook thing and, and on mm. le leaving messages on the website, when are you coming? Well, now we are coming. So you've been asking, let's hope you all show up. But the positive thing about all of this is 
um, uh, two or three of the dates have already sold out and second dates are, uh, are being talked about being put in, you know. So mm. um, it shows you something, you know. And um, I just hope it, it continues like that because I don't want to stop playing, but I, um, I may not um, drag myself r around the world constantly. There will have to be yeah. some breaks, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think you need to worry about the people not turning up. There's been a lot of interest. I know there was a lot of interest in the in the interviews. That's why I was a bit surprised that someone didn't didn't show up for one of the ones earlier on. But shit happens, you know, that people are, you know, they do what they yeah. do. But, but you've got, if I'm not mistaken, there's 15 or 16 albums in the can for you, okay? And everybody knows the big hits, but which which aspect of your career – that isn't as appreciated by the fans. Which aspect of that do you think you'll be playing on, on the uh, on the tour to maybe introduce it a bit more to the live audience? I was asked this in one of the other interviews that um, we've got fifty odd years worth, three hundred odd songs to choose from. Hmm. Um, I think the the opening part of the set and the ending part of the set kind of write themselves. Those two hmm. half an hours, it's the half an hour in the middle or more where we can mix it up a little bit. Um, and I think that you have to um, look at all all aspects. And I know that there are some songs that, that work better in some territories. With Australia, we're going to put the ball, um, sorry, the Peppermint Twist back in. Okay. Because it was a big number one there. Um, now, it may sound a little bit le less rock, but... There are people in that audience. Um, I've I've played in uh, Scandinavia, where it's a, um, an audience full of Kiss and ACDC t-shirts and Sweet t-shirts, hmm. and when we play Wigwam Bam, they're all jumping up and down. Now, um, that's not a heavy metal audience's song, but they love it. Hmm. So you can never second guess an audience. You know, you're you're silly if you think, oh, that's what they want. Uh, it, and it's it's when when we had that number one with with the peppermint twist, it wouldn't have been a song we would have chosen, but somebody at our RCA in um, in Australia mm. knew what was going to go on, released it to the radio stations. It went bananas, and it was our biggest hit ever in Australia. So we can't just deny, and why would we want to deny something that was that ex um, exceptional? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Actually, the same thing happened with Kiss and a song called Shandy. It was picked up in the same right. way that Sweet Song was that way. Yeah, but you, look, you got another song which is a bit different, but very 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 popular, which is Lovers Like Oxygen. So, will you be playing that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there might even be something else from from that later era because for me, that was the most musically challenging and the most. Um, uh, the one that's got when you hear the final recordings of of some of some of the things mm. like um, Mother Earth, you know from uh, from the um, from the cut above the rest album, the the album that followed. Mm. Um, you you look at these um, these these recordings, and when you when you remember that what we had as recording facilities back then uh, to what we what, what people have now with ultimate tracks on computer, you you no longer have to have generational losses. Um, I listened to some of the recordings to, back from the, to the seventies and uh, ELO, and, and so, some of the Queen recordings. They are so still now, you know, in their in, in their uh, warmth and mixing ability and editing, and you know, um, uh, and you you sometimes listen, listen to you know something's been um, recorded, you know, on um, uh, on. Um, uh, Pro Tools or something, oh, yeah, yeah, and, and it's it's it can sound bland because it you know um, if if you pull push things up too hard in di digital, you know you end up with that smacking sound, you know, but which it, it kind of drops out. Uh, whereas it, with mag magnetic tape, if you wanted to push something and the, and the meter went into the red, all it did was it it compressed and and shouted at you, hmm. and um, uh, I miss that. You know, um, okay. I can still see why people want to record drums on analog and then transfer it across. You know, I can still I can still see, you know, why why pe people would want to do that. And um, you know, my recording um, techniques go all the way back to two track reboxes. So, you know, it's um, yeah. uh, if if you haven't come through it all, you don't understand the um, 
because uh, I, I still keep saying to my engineer who's in my band now, he's the he's the second guitarist, keyboard player, he's, he's a brilliant guy. And I keep saying to him, shouldn't we bounce all those voices down, you know, to, to four tracks or something? And he laughs at me saying, they will be on four tracks, but they won't be the the 16 tracks that we've got over there. They'll, be, they'll still be there live, but we'll yeah. only have four to mix, hmm. you know, and I'm thinking – Brilliant. You know, it's it's a whole new world, isn't it? You it know? is. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying with the, 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 the live side of it, yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's a question for you. No doubt it's come up at some point in time, but I think the comparisons are, are unmistakable. Uh, and, and I'm talking about the influence that you've had on ACDC. Now, I think at some point in time, Harry Vander and George Young must have handed a very young and impressionable Malcolm a copy of Funny How Sweet Coco Can Be or, or Sweet Fanny Adams or Desolation Boulevard is probably more more around the mark there. Do, do you Have you had that feedback and have you even spoken to George or Harry about this? No, I haven't. Um, uh, I know Brian Johnson, who's the singer now, hmm. um, and he is very much steeped in the um, that 60s blues um Muddy Waters, BB King, you know all all that kind of stuff, and you can hear when he sings now with with the band mm. that he he has definitely got that um, um, that thing about him. Um, I was producing an album with him when he got the call, uh, come and do an audition for, for ACDC, and I'm not sure whether he was completely because I said to him, "Your voice and and that band are." I meant for each other, um, and and it stopped the album I was making because the um, uh, obviously if he's going to join ACDC, they don't want a Brian Johnson album going out at the same time. So um, you know, I just wished him well, and um, he's never looked back since. And um, uh, as far as the influence of ACDC, I mean, I love the guitar sounds. I love what they do. It's so open and and free and. Uh, and uh, sim- simplistic, but it but it isn't as simplistic as you think. Because I've heard people play sweet songs, and I know they're not playing it right because they just don't get the accents. They don't no. get the, uh, the 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 dynamic of it. And and it's the, it's the same with ACDC. I've heard pub bands doing ACDC songs, and it sounds like a pub band doing an ACDC song because if you don't get the dynamic and you don't get the you know the, the the straightforwardness of it. There was another band before them called Free. Um, you know Paul Rogers. Yeah, and um, and they were that the same kind of thing. You know, you've got to get that. You've just got to get the. You know, it, it's what it's what makes it. And um, uh, if you think that that there's been an influence from us on ACDC, apart from the name, of course, um, then um, I think that uh, I will take that. I will take that all day and every day. Is part of the same musical family, without a doubt. Okay, I, yeah. yeah. The Delta Blues thing, absolutely, and the the way you can't actually teach. No doubt, you've had this feedback. You can't actually teach your guitar style. You've either got it or you haven't. Mm. Yeah, that's that's true. People have said to me, um, you could probably pick up any guitar rig, and it would start to sound like Andy at the end. Yeah, you know, because I want to get a certain sound out of it. You know. Yeah. What What about the that high vocal that you've got? Where you've got the because that's employed a lot across rock and metal these days. It's it's it's, it's all over the shop. But I, I could, be, as I say, I could be wrong. But I thought you guys were the first to really bring it in. I'm not really steeped in the '60s stuff, but the '70s is really when my awareness starts to become a bit more apparent. So, we, yeah. where, where did you get that influence from? And do you think you were the first one in popular music? I'm talking about breaking large, having an influence on a global scene. Were you the first person to do it? Do you think? Uh, um, I'm not sure. Um, my influences go back to, to bands like uh, the Beach Boys. And, uh, of course, um, when we used to do a Beach Boys cover, I always used to be the fun, 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 till the daddy takes the demon away. <laughs> you know, that was always my 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 area. Hmm. And uh, a band called Vanilla Fudge came out. Come on, episode. Uh, yeah. and, and they were brilliant, um, uh, like a three-piece band with an with, with, no there were four they, they had a Hammond organ and, and they had that sort of harmony vocal with a with somebody hitting the, the top fifths and stuff uh, and also um uh there was a band called three dog night yeah with three lead singers and they were they were incredible and 
and, and sweet. Um, we always looked, even though we wanted to play like um, Led Zeppelin or um, or The Who or yeah. um, Deep Purple, um, we still wanted to retain the harm- harmony vocals that we all grown up with in the 60s, you know? So, yes, um, I think at the time, there, there were no other bands reaching, and the keys we were doing it in is the other thing, because most of my vocals were above the top E, you know, on a guitar, which yeah. um, is um, yeah. testing. A little bit testing, that is. How, how do you do it these days? Have you brought everything down a step or so, so to accommodate for it? Well, we, we play the songs, I would say, uh, one notch down tempo-wise, Hmm. And we de- because the, the sound um, we've learned now that the sound is better. We detuned to E flat, hmm. and it took a little while to get used to that because we did it about twenty years ago, to, um, just over twenty years ago. And there's something in your throat that is tuned to pitch. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you tune something down, and it's only a semitone, everybody's starting to go <clears throat> <clears throat> until until the voice. Uh, yeah. re- reattunes itself. Um, I find that um, in I'm the one who does the high vo- vocals, and uh, I have to admit it's getting a little bit more difficult as, as I've got older. Mm. But I used to be a choir boy and singing all the desk ants when I was in my you know the early teens and late you know like ten and eleven. Yeah, yeah. and I've never smoked. I don't really have moments of drinking you know heavily mm. and i think some of that has brought me out the other end still being able to sing you know in in that kind of range um there are notes that i'll never reach again but wh- when you when you're out in an audience it's one of those things you know instead of having five voices you've got four you know so mm. Well, it's just great that you're still doing it. I mean, that's 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 the real thing because a lot of people, to your point, mate, they don't even reach reach where you're at because they're dead. Yeah, all that yeah. abuse, yeah. all that abuse. Some of them lost Lemmy and David Bowie, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is that um, I'm in an area where I've done backing vocals with with ladies, with girls, and they're all looking at me, going, "How are you hitting that note?" You know, and I'm going, "Well." But they remember they're six kind of singing in real voice, and I'm hitting it with a hard metallic um, uh, falsetto. Yeah, it's a thing of grace, really. When you listen back to it, I, I do listen back to the as a singer. I listen back to you, and I think that's a gift. And you just you ran with it. You you didn't waste. You didn't squander your talent. No, well, that's a key. Um, talent is is a very um, emotive word, but I understand completely. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Look, I'll make this my final question, but I think you've have you got another one right now, or we, am I the last one? Uh, no, I can smell um, my wife uh, preparing <laughs> some form of breakfast, aren't you, oh, darling? Beautiful. <laughs> it's going to be a Spanish omelette, apparently. Oh, lovely. Hey. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. All right. Well, I'll make this one last one a good one. Uh, all, 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 right, of good, the, good all of you blokes that have done some, such tremendous work over the years, I like asking this question because every answer is different. Okay. But when you look back over your career, what gives you the greatest source of pride and feeling of accomplishment? Um, when I was in my teens and still doing okay academically, but realized that I was never going to be a professional footballer. And I, I learned that I could fiddle with the guitar, um, especially the, the guitar. Um, I used to get a lot of people saying, don't waste, waste your time, get yourself a career. And my wife now laughs at me when I tell people that I worked in a bank for a few months. And she said, what is it? You, you showed up at a bank for a few months and then became a <laughs> professional musician. So, so... All I would say to people is never give up, and if you believe in something, it can happen. And um, that's and there's always something around the corner. Even in your darkest of days, something will show up. You know, I've always been a believer in that. And uh, sometimes you can make things happen, uh, as we have done with the band um, um, in the mid '80s. Um, 
uh, my, um, Steve Priest had moved to America and Mick Tucker and I were living in, in England and I'd been producing other bands and writing and playing on other people's records. And I started to play with a, a pub band in London. And they were all of a sudden, a thousand people were showing up in the marquee to see this band play. And, I, I, and somebody said to me, why aren't you doing this with the suite? And I went, I don't know. And a light bulb went off. And I went, you know, went, went back to Mick and said, come on, get your drums out. We're off. Mm. And, and I haven't looked back since. And um, uh, I suppose it all comes down to the um, to that final thing. You know, don't let the bastards grind you down. Mm. Great advice. Mate, I'll let you get mm. to that breakfast. It's been uh, it's been fantastic to finally talk to you, a bloke who's done it and written part of the – you've certainly got a, your entry in there and a chapter in the great big book of rock and metal. There's no doubt about that. So thanks for doing what you've done, mate. You have had an influence and you have inspired many, and without you, rock and metal may sound very, very different. So there you go. Thank you, Andrew Mackay-Smith. That's what <laughs> – I wish that name is phenomenal. <laughs> You're a gentleman, mate. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll see you when you get down here. Definitely. Cheers. Right. Catch you, mate. See ya. Well, there you go. Andy Scott from Sweet Ladies and Gents. Hope you enjoyed that one. There are many more conversations over at scarsandguitars.com if you're curious, especially so if you love your extreme metal. So many chats just waiting and have also written a book. If you click the link in the banner on the website, you can go to a marketplace of your choice and try before you buy. You know the drill. All right, my name's Andrew Mackay Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. I'm really, really quite thrilled that uh, Andy liked my name, actually. That was uh, something that hasn't happened before either. Just a bit of a tidbit there toward the end. <laughs> anyway, Andrew Mackay Smith signing off. Hope you have a good one. Cheers.